What? Check, check, one, two. I like it right there, Ryan. Moose. <laughs> Hi, Miss Marina. Good morning, good morning. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check. Vernon Jackson. <laughs> All for you. Check, check. This is loud. Are you loud? Check, check, check.
I got it. Yeah. Mm. excited in this house this morning, amen, worship God, we're going to sing this song, oh the blood of Jesus, oh the blood, oh the blood of Jesus. He was despised and rejected. He was the man of sorrow and with grief. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity. And then he died and rose. And then he died and rose again. With all the power in his hand. Let's stand this morning, sing, oh, the blood.
God, a clap offering this morning. Father, we thank you, God. Master, we love you this morning, God. You are worthy of our praise. Amen. Let's slow things down. Let's worship Jesus in this place this morning. Sing this song in your great name. Amen. I mean, no demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Amen. There's power this morning in the name of Jesus. Let's worship him. Lost our Savior. Lost I saved, find way at the step, at the sound of your great name. All condemned, all condemned, feel no shame, feel no shame, at the sound, at the sound. Of your great name, every fear has no at the sound, at the sound of your great name, the enemy. Savior, defend. 
let's sing this song, Reckless Love, amen.
sing one more time. No shadow, no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. No wall. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Come on, somebody give him praise this morning. Father, we thank you, God. Master, you are awesome and mighty, God. Worthy this morning, God, of our praise, God. We thank you for who you are, God. Thank you for your grace, God. The love you have towards us, God. We give you praise this morning, God. You are awesome and mighty, God. Amen. Let's pray this morning, church. Let's believe, God, for a number of needs for salvation. We want to pray this morning for Marcus Calabasa and kids. Tyler Calabasa, Christopher Whiteface, Christy Whiteface, Felix Yawaki, Brandon Yawaki, Linda Salazar, uh, Johnny Candelaria and family, the Salago and Nakai family, Samantha Woody and family, Shana Jim and family, Jones family, Deidre family, Amanda and Quentin, amen. Uh, also Serenity and family, Romero. Martinez family, Brittany and Andrew, the Ramirez family, the Baca family, Torres family, Lorenzo family, Leanne family, Coden and Marcus, Elaine, Benito, Sally and Pauline. Let's continue to pray for our loved ones. Amen. Can y'all only imagine if all of these folks showed up to church? Oh man, it'll be a good day. Amen. We'll need that other side. Amen. Let's believe God for him this morning. Let's also pray this morning for Cisco. Uh, he's recovering this morning, so we want to believe God that God touches his body, brings healing to our brother. Amen. Also, Brianna Andreas' wife has body aches this morning, so we want to pray that God would touch her, heal her. Also praying this morning for the Jones family for restoration and healing. Kyle needs a new job, and uh, God to bless her finances. Amen. So we want to pray for our sister this morning, believing God for breakthrough in that area. Also, I want to say, uh, I believe here, uh, let's see here, Anthony and Clarissa, Barbara and grandson. Also, it's somebody's birthday, it says here, turning three years old, amen. So let's wish them a happy birthday, whoever wrote this on the list. I believe it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Quentin. Quentin's birthday, amen. He's going to be three years old. Most of y'all know Quentin running around the church like a little terrorist, amen. <laughs> so let's pray. Let's, let's wish him a happy birthday, Quentin, if you're watching online. Also, let's pray for your needs here this morning, amen. We serve a God that is good this morning. He's faithful to his saints. So let's lift up our needs this morning before Almighty God, amen. Let's also pray for our leadership, Pastor Mitchell, Pastor Tom Payne, Pastor Jeff Day, uh, Pastor Salas, his wife is their assist there, amen. It got to be clarified, Pastor Gerald Salas, amen, is their assist there in Blue Water, praying for our leadership, also praying for our leadership right here in the North Valley, amen. Our pastor, his wife, this morning, God continues to bless our leaders, amen. Also praying this morning for both Pastor Longs in their cities, Stockton and St. Louis. Pray for St. Louis, guys, that they get breakthrough, that God helps them, amen. God gives them key converts. Let's also pray for Pastor Vegas and his wife. You've seen what God's doing. You see most of their converts here last night. So let's continue to believe God for great things. Let's also go before God this morning praying for our sister churches. God would use them in their, in their services this morning to minister, amen, to their congregations. Let's also pray this morning, amen, believing God for our missionaries, our evangelists this morning. That God moves powerfully upon these men and women, giving them dominion in favor, amen. Also believe in God this morning, amen, for the nation of India. I want to pray that God moves powerfully in these couples, amen. Most of them are from here, homegrown in New Mexico, amen. So we want to pray that God moves in the nation of India, helps them. Let's also go before God this morning, amen. Believe in God for Pastor Surrogate, the Russian leadership. Also his baby church in Odessa. You pray for him. I just read an article yesterday. Russia attacked Odessa 
Ukraine and Odessa has about 800,000 people and it left about 500,000 of them without electricity. So let's pray that God has his hand of grace upon this precious couple. Amen. God moves and helps them. Let's go before God, church, not forgetting our nation, our leaders. Amen. Our first responders. Let's go before God. As I said, lift up your needs this morning. We're in revival. Amen. It's the first day, the first morning. I'm excited. Amen. It's a little bit of a rough night, but I'm excited. Excited to be in the house of God this morning. So let's let's believe God. Let's have our let's have Vernon Jackson come and open up our service this morning as we pray. Let's pray, church. Father, we thank you, God. Master, we're asking God that you would move this morning, God. God, that you would minister through your Holy Ghost, God. We thank you for all that you're gonna do, God. We pray, God, move upon the needs, God, of your people, God. So many sick in body. We pray for Steve, God, this morning morning, God, that you would touch him, heal him, God. We give you praise for all that you're going to do this morning, God. We come before you, Lord God, for, Lord God, for, for our needs, our assistance, Lord God, in our lives and our hearts. As we come before you, Lord God, all those who have listed the names on the list, Lord God, that you would move upon each one of them, Lord, and that, God, that you would move upon each heart that's here today and know that we're not here by mistake, Lord God, but that you have brought us here today as we start this revival, Lord God, that you would move powerfully, Lord God, in our lives and our hearts as we come and be prayed up, Lord God. Come and seek you, God, and inspect miracles, Lord Jesus. Change our lives and change our destiny, Lord God, as we would come before you, God. We thank you for this time together, Lord. We give this service up to you, Father. We give you glory. We give you honor. And, Lord, we cannot overemphasize, God, this revival that's starting, Lord God, that we begin with a real expectation, Lord God, that we're going to see you move in each one of our lives in some special way powerful way, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Let's give God glory. Amen. Check. Amen. Let's go ahead and greet your neighbor. Amen.
Amen. We have a few announcements as you're find, finding your seats. Uh, where's Ryan? Could you go ahead and play those, please? God, just want to remind you the building opens up every morning for prayer. You want to come lay hold of God, get your day started. We will not be having equipping the saints at 430 because of revival. So you come prepared to pray at five o'clock, six o'clock. Of course, we start a regular service this evening and the revival. Amen. All week. And that's through Thursday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. Amen. We'll be at seven o'clock. Of course, tonight at six. And then uh, don't forget the marriage seminar. You need to have your money in by today. And that's $50 per couple. And uh, please get with me on that. Amen. Or my wife won. And so if you're going to put it in the offering, you make sure you write it as such. Or if you just throw it in there, uh, it won't be counted uh, for marriage seminar. So make sure you put your name on there, marriage seminar. And then uh, you put that on there. And maybe some of you by faith want to be married by next year. You could put $50 marriage seminar for next year. Praise the Lord. Amen. So you never know. God is good. Can you say amen? Also, don't forget. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and have. Where's, uh, where's Jim? Where did Jim disappear to? Everybody's disappearing on me, man. Jim, would you testify about uh, all that went on last night? Amen. Hey man, last night we did a concert slash uh, play, and you know, it was amazing. Uh, I made it here like last night, everyone was set up, and just cool to see everyone working together. And uh, master producer, pastor over there running around, do this. Now, it was funny. Uh, just watch everybody come together. I don't know. Is this conference? Turn my mic off or something? Let me just step right here. So uh, last night it was cool. We did a couple of songs. And they went straight into the play. And the play was just so powerful. Like it was funny. And it was also just, there was so much preaching throughout the entire thing. And I, I, I don't know, I was sitting back here and I was just blown away of how it all worked out. Uh, it was an amazing night. At the end of the night, there were souls that were at the altar praying and uh, gave their lives to Christ. So it was just an amazing, amazing day. Even the outreaches were really good and fruitful, too. So I think God really helped us yesterday, and we're looking forward to all that God's going to do uh, at our next scene. Amen. Let's go ahead and give God a clap offering for that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I don't know, but it was, it was a great time. Uh, somebody came up to me and said, I didn't, know, I didn't know you can do that, Pastor, that you could work with plays. Well, you know, I, I can't take all the credit. Uh, my wife had the... A list of things uh, she said hey uh, check this out what do you think and uh, I broke it down and worked with it and uh, heck I never seen the movie uh, Beauty and the Beast and uh, but I seen the trailer and I said this is easy it has a message and I'll tell you what uh, uh, it was glorious when it was all said and done three people gave their life to Jesus uh, and I'll tell you what that's what it's all about uh, and uh, I'm already thinking about uh, tweaking that play a little bit and taking it to our baby church uh, and uh, see what God will do. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Let's give God one more clap offering for that. Father, we so thank you for the souls that were added to the church. A tremendous uh, opportunity that we have. Um, amen. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take an offering this morning or receive the offering. And uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 says... Uh, now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us 
diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Amen. And so now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. In other words, uh, victory in Jesus. Can you say amen to that? And so we've uh, been able uh, recent to see the victory of God uh, in this church, in the ministries that we are a part of, and launching a church recently and seeing the fruit of that. Uh, recently, uh, just last week, I was talking with uh, uh, Brother Randy in St. Louis, and he says uh, he sent me a picture of his Bible study. There was probably 20 people in his Bible study. And so, you know, the victory. Amen. Last night, the play, there was 80 people here, 80 plus uh, people in the packed house. Uh, uh, people saved. Visitors came. And, and you could talk about victory. Are you with me? The, the smell of victory the scripture deals with. It's a smell of victory. And, but yet, uh, when you deal with victory, there comes a sacrifice. Amen. There's no victory that comes without sacrifice. If we look at past wars uh, and how many people paid the price uh, for the great victories, amen, that have been accomplished uh, in World War II, is a, it was probably the greatest uh, uh, war, the greatest victory that this, this uh, here United States has ever experienced in, in my uh, uh, history, uh, learning about wars and just researching. World War II was radically uh, uh, will go down as one of the greatest things that the United States has ever been a part of uh, because we had the greatest victory. Can you say amen? But if you look at the price that was paid solely, just, if you just look uh, at Pearl Harbor uh, and see the price that was paid for the great victory. I mean, in other words, uh, people laid down their lives. A lot of things happened. A lot of lives were lost. Uh, people came back uh, without limbs. Uh, Families were affected. Amen. But there's a great price to be paid for victory. And we could go on to talk about the cross and Calvary and the great price our Lord Jesus paid with his own blood on Calvary's cross so that you and I could be free. And everything we do, amen, can I tell you, we can have victory. We're into it, man. How many were cheering the victory last night? Are you with me? It was nice to see people tearing down that aren't even part of our church. I mean, we, 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 they were just hauling stuff away. Uh, new converts were involved. Um, amen. People telling me, you know what, Pastor, next time I want to do this, I want to be involved. Um, and they're committing to themselves. Say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be more involved in the church because I want to be a part of what we're about. But it comes with a price. You know, we give to everything we do. Brother Randy now, he's having a revival on the 9th. He starts at the end. We end our revival on the 9th. He begins his revival. And he asked if we could help him. I said, obviously, yes, of course. He's having a breakthrough. We need to push that thing through, right? We have revival this week. Amen. And we're praying for the new churches, rent, all their bills. And, and so this is what we are. We're, it, it costs. Are you with me? But we are hearing the victories. Last night, a new convert. From our new church testified in the concert. Amen. And the concert I went to recently at his church, three of the new or two other new converts testified. We're talking about victory. We just came back from a men's class and my pastor, Pastor Day, said, How many men did Vicente have? Pastor Vicente. I said, With him and his two kids, he had eight total, five new people, men at the men's class. Are you with me? He said, now that's victory. Listen, it costs. You continue to give, pay your tithes, your offerings, your pledges, and God is going to give us victory. Amen. Hallelujah. So you make sure you do that, and God will bless you. I'm going to ask if I could. Josiah, would you ask God's blessing on both gift and giver? Amen. Hallelujah. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the nation see that our God alone is wonderful. And every day His people shout, the Lord has saved. Savior of the nation, we proclaim your praises, your name be lifted high. Jesus, Jesus, Savior of 
thy nation and all we see the Lord be lifted high. Amen. Thank you, musicians and singers. Praise God. We're going to go ahead and turn our brother Johnny Valtierra, evangelist for many years, loose. Amen. He's going to have a great revival. Amen. Let's give him a warm welcome. Great to be here this morning and the next night believing God to help us and nothing as exciting as seeing a church you know be changed a church grow God adding to the church what a what a wonderful thing we're a part of amen and so I really do appreciate the invitation and so I want to kind of start uh, trying to lay the groundwork um, for our faith um, in God. And so I want to read out of the book of Second Chronicles this uh, morning, Second Chronicles chapter 20. Now the book of Second Chronicles is kind of like a part two to the book of Kings and uh, a historical account. A different version. There are details in in um, Second Chronicles you don't find in uh, the Book of Kings, um, and so I just uh, thought I'd minister, uh, believing God to help us, not just for the next few nights, uh, but set a precedent for our lives. You know, God is a God that answers prayer. And nowhere are we more challenged, no time have we ever been more challenged than in our society, a very confused generation we're a part of. And we have only are seeing the results of bad decisions, bad choices, people who drastically altered their bodies because they believed the lie, you know, that... that uh, you're actually what you feel, and you can become what you feel, but that, that's fantasy. It's not true. And we're seeing now some of the evidence coming back. And so I want to lay the groundwork to believe in God. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. Now it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon... And others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And somebody came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazan, Hazazan Tamar, Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, or we can say he became afraid. So he set himself to seek the Lord, proclaiming a fast throughout all of Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Go down to, to uh, verse 15, uh, 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the middle of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all of you, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, O King Jehoshaphat, 
Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And so in our text, Jehoshaphat is under attack. Like many people, no doubt, he is minding his own business the way good people should do. You want a secret in life? M-Y-O-B, and you'll have a good life. Mind your own business, and you have a good life. And so he's going about his day, tending to his affairs, tending to his daily routine, when all of a sudden, somebody brings bad news. And he is informed that Moab, or a confederacy along with Moab, have come. They've surrounded the city, and they're getting ready to plunder the city. The first thing we read is that Jehoshaphat became afraid. Now, fear is a natural response. You know, people want to say, well, I'm never afraid. Well, you know, you're not real then. I've been in situations where I I have had to deal with the spirit of fear. And so it's not that we are not affected by it. It's a natural response. It's a God-given response. You know, fear, it can heighten your senses. It makes you aware of certain details in life. Certain things that are about to come down. And so it's not that we never have fear. It's just that we don't live in fear. And so the Bible says the bad news came. What does Jehoshaphat do? Immediately as he becomes afraid, he then begins to act rational. And he calls together all the peoples, all the tribes. I say, look, man, this is bad news. We need to pray. And as he begins to pray, what I like about this text is that he begins to reference off the promises of God. He begins to reference off of past things God has done. And he reminds God, are you not God that brought us into this land? Are you not the God that said, do not drive them out, you'll take care of them? Well, here they are. They've now come up against us. um, And he begins to almost remind God, uh, are you not our God? Uh, The Bible says that he claims uh, uh, that that old old, uh, promise, uh, if disaster comes uh, and we seek your face and we pray, you'll answer. And so he sets himself to pray. He brings together the people to pray. And he begins to lay hold of the promises of God. I want to challenge you this morning to learn to live the way Jehoshaphat did in the promises of God. Note story, three preachers were talking about prayer. And in general, what was the appropriate and effective position for prayer? As they're talking, there's a telephone repairman. So this is obviously an old story. Working on the phone system in the background. One of the preachers shared that he felt that the key to prayer was in the hands. He says, I always clasp my hands and pray. That's the key. Another one says, no, I've learned that it's on the knees. That if you get on your knees and pray, that's the key to prayer, knee on the knee. Another one, the third one says, well, I've always believed that the key to prayer is to lay yourself prostrate before the Lord. The telephone repairman by this time can't get enough of this. And he jumped into the conversation and says, You know what, preachers? I have found that the most powerful prayer I've ever made was while I was dangling upside down by my heels from a power pole, suspended 40 feet above the ground with no help. He says, That's the key to prayer. And that is so true. Prayer and trouble should go hand in hand. When trouble comes, you should pray. 
when trouble comes, uh, the natural thing for the Christian is to pray. We have a Father who cares about us. We have a Father who hears us. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, He inclines His ear. It's not that God is deaf and demented. It's just a loving image of God the Father to a child who whispered something, um, and he and cl- what did you say? What did you say, dear? And so the natural response um, when we encounter fear, when we encounter like Jehoshaphat surrounded, um, he, you know, he knows. Jehoshaphat knows he doesn't stand a chance. He's surrounded. And the first thing the invading armies would do is they would cut off the food line, cut off the water supply. There's no water going to come into the city. There's no food going to come into the city. And then the enemy would simply surround or besiege the city. And they would just bide their time. They just wait until the pangs of hunger. They would wait until the people became parched with thirst. And then and many of them would begin to surrender. That's how they conquered people. And so Jehoshaphat knows as he's surrounded, he doesn't stand a chance. I don't know about you, but in the 40 years that my wife and I have been Christians um, in the ministry, I've been there, surrounded, no answer. Uh, What am I going to do? I don't know. But we need to pray. Like, Like here, a pastor in California And buildings are just an impossibility. We had uh, located a building and um, uh, got into that building. uh, We're using that building for quite some time, but it was always on the market. And so from time to time, you know, we touched base with the owner and, and the market wasn't too hot. So nobody was looking to buy back then. But every now and then, the owner would say, you know, they've got people interested in the building. And so where I pastored in California, uh, the area I was in, no buildings. This is, this is the ideal building, the ideal place. It was large. We had our nurseries. We had our prayer room. We had a fellowship. It was a nice facility. And I remember one time getting a letter from the owner saying, we had 30 days to vacate the premises because the building had been sold. Now, remember reading the letter and, you know, man, I'm thinking uh, to myself, you know, because this is what fear does, right? It causes you to imagine things. I'm imagining myself, man, we're going to have church. We're going to be out in the park, in the heat, out in the park, in the cold. We're, going, we're in the parking lot. We're going to have church at. But I didn't say anything. I didn't tell the church anything. I remember reading the letter and coming to pray and began to pray about this. You know, I don't want to sound an alarm and make it urgent. You know, you don't want to do that. And so I remember praying, and a week goes by, and I prayed again, kept praying again. Another week goes by, and then the third week goes by. Now, now I'm thinking, man, I should have told the church. Maybe we could have done something, but I didn't. And I remember one day coming to prayer with that letter. And I remember coming before God at the morning. I'm praying, and I read the letter out loud. And then it's kind of like a light bulb came on. Because I remember saying, you know what, God? This is not my church. This is your church. These are not my people, Lord. These are your people. This, none of this is mine. It's your church, God. And as a matter of fact, because this is your church, you see this letter here, God? This is your problem. And I took that letter, put it under the pulpit, and walked away. A few days later, the owners call me and say, listen, we don't know what happened. 
were just ready to close on the building, on the sale, and for some reason, they pulled out. Uh, they're not going to sell. You can stay there. And I remember this time because it did something to my faith. It, it did something to me. It said, this is the God we serve. Who when you're surrounded, God's not in panic mode up in heaven. Oh, Angel Gabriel, what are we going to do? The people, you know, recession and COVID. They're COVID. They want to bring COVID back. God does not fear. God is in control. He knows what he's doing. And so what did Jehoshaphat do? He began to lay hold of the promises of God. This is personal. Sometimes uh, as you're going through something, uh, you have to go to the Word of God. Uh, I remember many times in times of trouble, going especially through the book of Psalms uh, and reading how the psalmist David uh, many times in a crucial time would say, God, you're my God and you're going to help me. You are my strength. You are my battle. He says, you're my shield, meaning you protect me. You defend me. You're my buckler, meaning you'll fight for me. You are my spear. You will battle for me. And come to time, time to you got to come back to the word of God. Say, I'm going to believe this. I'm going to stand upon the word of God. You know, I've had uh, numerous Bibles um, in all the years I've been a Christian. Um, one of the habits I have on my Bible is marking it up. And there are dates um, in the paragraphs of my Bible. There are dates um, many times where God spoke to me a specific word. Uh, or maybe my own personal reading, reading through a passage. Uh, and it's like a scripture just leapt up because God uses his word like that because the word of God is alive. And many times I would note that down because it probably wasn't a promise for that day, but for the future. And I would make note of it. I've got old Bibles that are scribbled up because God spoke to me. And I begin to learn that process to lay hold of the promises of God. It's called staking a claim. You know, the phrase staking a claim goes all the way back to 1849. When people migrated to San Francisco, they say within six months, 800,000 people came into San Francisco when word spread that there was gold up in them, their hills. People began to come from as far as China, from the East Coast, selling their meager belongings so they can travel across the country to get to San Francisco where word spread. There's gold in them hills. And so people would come. In those days, they call it the California dream. Today, it's the California nightmare. But people uprooted their homes, their families, their kids, and moved the ground because word spread. There's gold. They're finding gold. Let me tell you something about the word of God. This is more precious than gold. And so they would come. And when you would come, you would not just say, man, I lay a hold to all that mountain. No, that's not the way it works. I recall one time coming out of prayer, it's the pastor and myself and another disciple. And as we're standing outside, deciding where to go get some coffee, this beautiful Cadillac drives by. Beautiful car. I'm looking at it. Before you know it, the disciple says, I claim that Cadillac in the name of Jesus. Well, that's not the way it works. Maybe first you ought to claim a job. <laughs> and so when people would go out to stake and claim, they didn't just say, I claim the whole mountain, it's all mine. You can do that. You had to get your pick and your shovel. 
He had to go dig the earth, break dirt, break rock. And when you found maybe a speck, the indications was if you found a speck of gold, maybe even a nugget, that there's got to be more down there. And so what they would do, they'd pull out an old iron stake, drive it into the ground, pull out some kind of identification or name, put it on a piece of paper, get an old tobacco, kin, uh, tobacco tin can and stick it in there and then put it on top of the stake and run down to the nearest register's office to stake a claim. That's what they did. So it took work. It took effort sometimes. And you don't know what you're going to find, but you're believing. That's the same principle with the Word of God. There are moments in your Christian walk where this is your personal battle. We thank God for general prayer. We thank God for prayer, you know. But you know, there are personal battles that only you, only you know about and can do something about it. We, you know, we make a general prayer. God, I pray for, for the leaders of our fellowship. Yes, we do. But every one of those men right now is going through personal things that you're not privy to. And they have to fight it. There's people here today. You have, maybe you're surrounded. Maybe you're about to lose your job. Your home, your car, it happens. You're the one that's going to have to take this before God. Yes, we pray together as a corporate body, but sometimes you've got to discuss, this is my fight, man. This is my battle. And so Jehoshaphat does just that. And so this is the image of staking a claim. They lay hold of something, but even Jehoshaphat not only does it remind God of all that, he, that had taken place, but I love what he says in our text, verse 7. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham? Then he adds, almost like for emphasis, your friend forever. Oh, by the way, he says, your friend Abraham, your friend forever. Abraham had been dead for 1,100 years. Jehoshaphat never shared a meal with Abraham. He never drank tea with Abraham. Abraham had been long dead. So what is he doing by laying? By the way, remember Abraham, your friend? What he is doing, he's reaching back into the past. Yeah, what you did for Father Abraham, your friend forever. I'm related to Abraham. And because Abraham was your friend, I'm your friend too. He's bringing the God of the past into his future, present situation. See, we don't have no problem reading the Bible and believing what God did in Genesis. We got no problem reading about Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. But a lot of times the problem has, how do we get this into our day today? Especially in our modern technological society. I mean, we're not cavemen like Abraham. We, we're, we're modern people. And it's often that's the problem. We, we, we can't bring the God of the past into our present situation. That's what the Jehoshaphat does. I love it. Abraham's been dead for 1,100 years. But he calls on a promise of God, your friend forever. And he brings God into the present. When I was a young convert, uh, been saved for a couple of years, 
We had tremendous revival in our mother church. We had taken on a building project, about a year of building high ceilings, massive undertaking. I was the leader. I was the song leader. We finished up. We're having our grand opening celebration. I'm driving home from work. It was a week before Thanksgiving. And as I'm coming home, I'm driving around a curb when there was a vehicle stalled. I was going to rear end him. So instead of that, I drove to the left, which was a worse mistake because I hit on a Ford pickup truck head on collision. The impact threw me to the back because I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. We didn't wear seatbelts in those days. Fractured C5, C6. I opened my eyes after the impact and I began to try to get out of the vehicle and suddenly realized I cannot move a single muscle. I'm paralyzed. The impact broke C5, C6 vertebrae in your neck. I was completely paralyzed. See, it's great to read about somebody else's story. It's a different thing when it's you. Here I am, 22, paralyzed from the neck down. Images begin to flow through my mind. Man, there goes my career with the Los Angeles Lakers. They're not going to call me now. You know, 22, about to get married, about to believe God for future ministry. But I remember the well-wishers, and God blessed them. You know, people that came by, hey, we're praying for you. God, do you know the battle was? At 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 when nobody else was there except me in that little ICU room. And I remember the lies of the devil. See, you're never going to walk again. Where's your God now? Huh? Look, look what God did to you. Look what God allowed to happen. All those lies. But I remember I would just muster up enough faith to say, you know what? God's in control. God's going to heal me. And I begin to worship. I begin to pray. And I could, I could feel the Spirit of God coming into that little room. I'm with the assurance. I'm with you. I'm here. And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, they did a surgery because they couldn't do that automatic, uh, immediately because of the swelling. But I began to gain movement. The first part of my body that I moved was my little Twinkie. I remember moving that and shouting, praise God. To a lot of people, the Twinkie... What good's the Twinkie? <laughs> but see, I knew that if God can heal the Twinkie, he can heal the whole hand. And if he can heal the whole hand, he can heal the whole arm. And then the rest of me. And sure enough, I, I began to move my hand, began to move my arm, and I remember shouting, praise God. See, I believe in instant miracles. I've prayed for people. Last year, I prayed for a person that was blind, Bolivia. God touched them, healed them. But there are also times where you're just going to have to fight it out. Well, going up against the lies of the devil, you have to remember that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. I am the Lord. I change not. And so we're going to have to believe God for that. And then we have to position ourselves. He prays and he calls upon the people. They come together and then they lay hold of the friendship. of it. What he's doing, he's positioning himself. See, there's no power in me. 
I pray for sick people. People get healed. There's no power in me. It's my position in Jesus Christ. It's my position in God, my Father. I've understood this throughout the years. I position myself understanding who I am in Jesus. You know, that's the whole process of salvation. You don't just confess your sins, but you're believing in the death of Christ, understanding who Jesus is. And the Bible tells us that as they begin to do that, God begins to move in the background. Because there's also back in those days what they call claim jumpers. They're not part of a restaurant franchise. They're actual thieves. Thieves that would hide in the bushes and they're looking. Oh man, look, he found, he found some gold. And as they would put their information, go down to the local registers, they'd come in and steal the claim. See, that's what the devil does. The devil's a liar. He's a thief. He's a thief. And so is his mother-in-law. They're liars. And he's going to come. He's going to lie to you. He's going to tell you the lies. That's all he does. He works from a platform of lies. And you have to fight against this. How do you do that? You lay hold of the word of God. I read another story about David Wilkerson, who was pioneering in New York, and he's having a rough time. And you got to remember, this is the 70s, David Wilkerson's a white guy from, where was he from, Arkansas somewhere, I don't know, Midwest. He's in New York City, fast time, fast city life. He's trying to pioneer a church. He's not having much success. So he drove upstate New York, and he got off walking among some fields. And as he's walking, he's, he's, he's questioning his calling, He's questioning whether he made the right decision to come to New York City to pioneer a church. And, you know, the devil's a liar. The devil's lying to him. And as he's thinking about this, he's walking, when all of a sudden, right in front of him, this huge, massive bull kind of just comes out of nowhere. The bull looks at David Wilkerson and immediately lowers its horns begins to paw at the ground, a sure sign this bull is going to charge. David at this time was probably 110 pounds, not very big, you know. The bull's right in front of him. He knows he doesn't stand the chance. His bull is going to send him to kingdom come. And as the bull begins to charge, he, he doesn't stand a chance. You know what he does? He simply puts his hands up. He says, I praise you, Jesus. The moment he said Jesus, the bull kind of stopped in its tracks, kind of looked at David, and then huffed and puffed and turned around and trotted away. I don't believe it was 110 pounds of David Wilkerson that stopped that bull. I don't believe there was simply the fact that he was an American. I believe the moment he said, Jesus, things began to shift. That's what it means, position yourself. Thank God for our fellowship. Thank God for all that we do as a fellowship. But it's Jesus that answers prayer. It is Jesus that fights our battles. It is Jesus that's in control. I was in India once preaching, and one of the brothers of the church came up and asked me if I could pray for his sister who's dying of tuberculosis. I said, sure, we'll go tomorrow morning after prayer. 
We get to the church, we pray, we leave, we start driving outside of Mumbai. Mumbai is a massive city. We drive and drive. Finally, we get to this old, looks like an old English compound. There's one section for the women, one section for the men. And I remember walking in. I said, you're going to have to tell us where she's at or go call her. Maybe she can come out. You know, I'm not even thinking. You can't. She's, at, she's dying. You can't walk no more. Your lungs are shot. Finally, I walk in, and there's these little army cots, about, about 50 deep. And then going that way, about 50 deep, I said, my goodness, we're not going to find her in this place. He locates her. I go pray for her. And he's interpreting because she speaks Tamil, and, and I'm talking in English. Um, and so I'm interpreting, you know, we're going to believe God, we're going to pray. We pray for her. We believe God to touch her. And then I, I said to the translator, tell her to pray in the name of Jesus. When I said the name of Jesus, a little girl next door, she's about 15, 16 years old. She, when she heard Jesus, she kind of stirred and begin to look around and begin to look at me. I'm watching this out of the corner of my eye. You know how sometimes you do that? You, you do. <laughs> I'm watching this, uh, and I'm, I'm seeing her. You know, she, she's trying to get up, and, and she's trying to, trying to make some kind of a signal. And so we pray for the sister. We're about to walk away when suddenly the girl next door begins to wave her hands and she's basically yelling in Tamil. I stop, I ask the translator, I says, what does she want? He says, she wants you to pray for her in the name of Jesus. And so this obviously, you know, became curious to me. What do you mean? Has she heard the name Jesus before? So he began to talk to her, and it turned out when she was four years old, five years old, she attended a Baptist Sunday school that taught her the name Jesus, taught her about the things of God. And when I said to the sister in the name of Jesus, something came alive on the inside. See, that's the power. The name of Jesus. The Bible says um, that as they begin to pray, God moves upon the prophet uh, and he says to the man, of, um, the, the King Jehoshaphat, uh, he says, Look, uh, don't be afraid. You're not going to have to fight. You're going to have to get engaged because the battle is not yours, but it's God. What are you saying? Stand aside, man. God's going to get involved here. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Stand aside. I'm going to get involved, God says. Stand aside. It's where the psalmist says, be still or be quiet and know that I am God. You know that image of the book of Psalms, what is it, 46, I think? Be still. The wording is a mother talking to an infant child that's, that's fuzzy, you know, agitated. You know how babies get, right? And the mother saying, be still, be still, be calm, be calm. That's what God says. Hey, stop it. You know, you're running around like a chicken without your head. You, you think the world's going to come to an end. Stop. Be quiet. Let me take care of it. Let me take care of it. That's the God I serve. We do get agitated, don't we? Christians are the best road ragers in the world. Because we camouflage it under kingdom business. Don't they know I need to go pray for somebody? Get out of the way. 
We are the worst road ragers, aren't we? Impatient. You know, think about our world. Our world's gone nuts. People go through McDonald's drive through and after they get their order, they pull off to the side and they check their order. And lo and behold, they didn't get enough fries. I don't know what they do. Do they count them? Um, hey, man, there's only 56. They're supposed to have 58 fries. Come on. Get off their car and go assault the poor teenager that's working at me. You know, that's crazy, isn't it? Mean uh, people have been shot and killed because their order was wrong. I feel for People that work at fast food restaurants. I feel for them. The world's gone nuts. You know, if you didn't get enough fries, maybe it's a sign. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, how many are there supposed to be? I don't know. But I know that three fries ain't worth losing your, your victory, your life, your freedom. But the world's gone nuts. Agitated, angry, road rage. God says, be still. I'll take care of it, son. I close with an old story. True story. I was in Darwin, Australia. And the crocodiles are huge, massive. They're dinosaurs, man. And I was reading about a particular incident. A family's out at, by a river and they're having a family barbecue fellowship. The boys are in the water when all of a sudden this crocodile comes and he grabs one of the boys' legs, begin to drag him away. The other boys notice that, they, you know, they grab their cousin and they're trying to help him. He started yelling for help. People on the bench are, what's going on? Oh, a crocodile, crocodile. There's an ant. Atia, she noticed this, gets off the bench. She had a skirt on, kind of tied her skirt together, ran into the water, jumped into the water, went up to that crocodile and said, in the name of Jesus, let him go, and smacked that crocodile. And guess what the crocodile did? Release her nephew. I don't think the crocodile, man, she is like Mike Tyson. I don't think so. I think the moment she said, in the name of Jesus, let him go. So I want to challenge you. Some of you got people you're praying for. Loved ones, relatives, a spouse. I love what the pastor said, you know. Maybe you can't make it to the, uh, the seminars uh, for Valentine's Day, but give an offering, believe God, have faith. How else are you going to get a wife if you don't have faith? Huh? Anyways, that's a different thought. Some of you know you're surrounded. You're surrounded. You know, one of the great revelations of COVID was we don't have a lot of control. We think we're in control, but it's an illusion. You're not in control. As a matter of fact, not only are you not in control, you don't own anything. You're just borrowing it for the time being. Because you're not going to take it with you. We don't own anything. Well, I got five houses. You don't own nothing. You pay taxes to the state, to the city. They own it. We don't own much. We don't have much control, but we can believe God. There's some of you, you know what I'm talking about. You're surrounded. Could be an illness, a sickness, a disease, finances. I want to challenge you to lay hold of God's promises. 
Let's believe God. I want you to bow your heads, every head bow, every eye closed. You're here this morning. You can identify. You know what I'm talking about. I've been there. I know what it's like to be surrounded. I know what it's like to seem like we're going under. We're not going to survive this. We're not going to make it through here. I remember one time early in our ministry, we had a rebellion in our church. And I've never felt the spirit of fear as in that moment. The devil began to lie. He said, see, all these people are leaving. By the time I'm done, there's not going to be one person left. And I remember fear. I'm a father. We pioneered in California, raised a family. I've heard the lies, the devil telling me, you know, your kids, you know, your kids, uh, they, they belong to me. And going, getting them through those difficult times of teenage years, you know, trying to get them through, make, make them understand. I remember many times the lies of the devil. I know what it's like, folks, to be underwater. I know what it's like to look at your bank account and say, man, we're not going to make it. I don't know how we're going to make it this month. I don't even know how we're going to make it this week. I've been there. But I've believed God, and over and over and over, I can testify like David. I've been young. I'm older now. And I've never seen the righteous begging for bread. God takes care of his people. Some of you today, you need to believe God once again. I wonder this morning, you're not born again. You're not saved. This is the first step. If you're not born again, you will not make heaven your home. We're not talking about joining a church, a fellow. We're talking about meeting Jesus. If you don't know Jesus... You want to know him right now. Would you lift up your hand saying, I'm not, a, I'm not a Christian preacher. I'm not even living right. I'm in sin. I need prayer. Would you lift up your hand? Maybe you're a backslider. Far from God. Or you're familiar with the word. You're familiar with the routine. You know the Christian cliche. But your heart's not right with God. You need to get your heart right. Backslider. Didn't get you. Would you lift up your hand? Hallelujah. I see that. And others, God speaking hearts. You're not right. You're far from God. And God wants to help you. That's why he continues to deal with us. You're not saved. You're not born. You lifted your hand up here. Would you look at me? Young, would you come? Would you come? Would you come? You lifted your hand for salvation. Get up out of your seat. Come find a place to pray. I need somebody to come pray. We're going to stand. We're going to open up the altar for a time of prayer. Allow God to help us and speak to our hearts. Hallelujah. As we sing a chorus of worship real quickly. Thank you, Jesus. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Hallelujah. Shamba Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Jesus, you are the Lamb 
the Lord Father we give you praise hallelujah thank you Jesus we give you praise wonderful Jesus hallelujah praise God anybody sick in body you need prayer you're sick in body would you come you're sick in your body. Maybe you have pain in your body right now. If you come, God, God will touch you. God will touch you. Hallelujah. What's wrong? I can talk to this. What happened? I started coughing up blood. Uh huh. And I had to go to the surgery. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. But they know my stuff. My esophagus. And so, basically, what happens is what it goes thin, right? Yeah, yeah, the blood vessels. Yeah. You got problems with your liver? No. No? Okay. When do you go back to the doctor? They're going to do, they already did the endoscopy. No, they already did it. I've been in the hospital. Okay. All right. I want you to pray with me. Father, the blood of Jesus heals my body. Right now, Lord, I command sickness, disease, leave my body. I command the esophagus. To be healed in the name of Jesus. We take dominion. Loose tormenting demon. Father we pray in Jesus name. Do you um, drink alcohol? That's the problem. And so we can pray until we're blue in the face. But I really want to tell you, if you repent, whatever alcohol you have at home, whatever, get rid of it. Okay, all right. And so you, you make a decision. Let me tell you something. God will heal your body. God's a good God. He's not against you. He's for you. And, and I've been there. Huh? I'm an ex-doper. And for years, I carried the... Uh, hepatitis C virus did not even well I kind of caught it back in 1999 but the treatment was so brutal but anyways God healed me stage 4 cirrhosis meaning that's it buddy you're not far your liver is about to give up God regenerated that he's been healing my body went back to the doctor it was the last year he says, we don't know what's going on, but your liver is, is recovering. Uh, and uh, he, he looked at me and said, son, you got another 30 years to go, man, because God did that. And so when you surrender that, don't, don't listen to the devil. The devil's a liar. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What's wrong, sis? Okay. So you had that for a while? Or? Uh, this, is past week. this past yeah. week. Um, okay, pray with me. Father, the blood of Jesus heals my body. We break the curse of sickness, disease, in the name of Jesus. Wonderful, Lord, we give you praise. Hallelujah. What's wrong? 
Okay, and the sides, both sides. And so, how long has that pain been there? You know, if, if anything's wrong with your kidneys, no. You don't know. Oh, okay. Back. What do you do for work? Okay. Pray with me, Father. The blood of Jesus heals my body right now. Pray with me, Father. In Jesus' name, I command the back, the lumbar, to be healed. Command the muscles, the tendons, be healed. In Jesus' name, Handa Roboki. Try, try to try to check that. Try, try to try to do something you can do. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Huh? Really good. Praise God. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. You know, in the book of uh, Luke, the disciples, um, uh, after the, the, the uh, crucifixion of Christ, on the road to Emmaus, I don't know if you've ever read the story, two of the disciples are walking back when Jesus comes alongside, but they don't know it's Jesus. And Jesus asked them, hey, what's wrong with you guys? Why are you guys so bummed out? And they say, don't you know? Haven't you heard the things that were done? Now, if anybody knew, it was Jesus. But they don't know it, that it's Jesus. But the Bible says that he opened the mind of their understanding. That after Jesus left, it's kind of, wow. That was Jesus. And so what that shows us, a couple of things. Number one, there's that physical barrier, okay? And then there's that supernatural barrier. God's going to help you. He is going to give you understanding in the word, in dealing with people. Listen to me. We need this. I came off the streets. I didn't know anything about Christianity and I would pray, God, teach me, please. Teach me, Lord. God began to help me. God began to do things in my heart. And that's what he's going to do. Number one, he's going to open up your eyes of your When you begin to read the word of God, the lie is, I don't understand it. That's what the devil wants you to believe. And God's going to help you, give you understanding. Father, I pray, God, by the Holy Ghost, I thank you right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let's give God praise, church. Handa roboboki. shikata. Thank you, Lord. I want to challenge you to, 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 you know, a lot of us, we know what it's like to, to be surrounded. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to look at my checkbook and say, man, how are we going to make it this week? And God over and over and over and over again continues to bless us, continues to help us. As a pastor, I remember looking at what I would make in a year. You know, according to California standards, that was poverty. But didn't seem like it to us. Because God takes care of you. And it's not like, you know, I'm going to give to God and I'm going to get a check in the mail Monday. No, no, no. It's not the way it works sometimes. Sometimes it does. But what happens many times as you pay your tithe, as you're liberal, with God makes the 90% go longer. I don't know how he does it, but he does. And I want to challenge you because many times when we're surrounded financially, the first thing to do is, man, I'm not going to pay my tithe this week. That's the biggest mistake you can make. Trust me. I don't know how he does it, but he does. Listen to me. I pastored in California, and, I, you know, at the end of the year, you're handing out the tithe receipts. And I look at some people, man, you know, According to this calculation, they're making ninety thousand dollars a year, and here I am making ten thousand. But it seemed like it was the opposite. It's 
seemed like I was making the 90, and they were making the 10. Because God does honor you. And I want to challenge you. There's some people you're praying for. There's people today you're praying for. A loved one, a relative, a friend. I want you to bow your heads. We're going to believe God this morning. Everyone, bow your head. Let's pray. Father, we believe you today. That your word is faithful. We stand upon the promises you gave to Father Abraham. And what you did in the past, we believe you can do today. We invite you, God, into the present tense. We thank you for salvation and for all the blessings. We're going to believe you. Stand upon your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord as our pastor comes, amen. Father, we thank you. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We, we claim those promises of the past, past victories that God had in, in his word. And the people of God, the great victories you can go back and say, hey, that's for me too. Amen? That's a, what a blessing. There's nuggets, amen. Nuggets in the word of God that God wants to give you. To give you victory to believe and give you your own personal victories. That you can live from glory to glory. Can I? Can you say amen? Hallelujah. But tonight, don't forget, uh, prayers at five, services at six. Uh, there's plenty of flyers. Take some. Uh, Invite people, take a picture of the flyer, send it to people you know. We're going to believe God all week, amen. God's going to help us. We're going to be dismissed. I'm going to ask if I could uh, get Brother Eric, if you close us in a word of prayer, please. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.